Shabbat Shalom. So we are less than 30 days away from Rosh Hashanah, less than 40 days away from Yom Kippur, uh, the fall holidays, the days of awe, 10 days of awe, the auspicious time. And we're in this period of preparation, this 40, 30, 40 days of preparation, 30, 30 days of month of Elul plus 10 days of the days of Watt, all 40 days. We're in this time of preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And uh, I don't know if you've heard this described that way, but I mean, often you may hear, if you, if you, re, if you, you know, read Jewish sources, traditional Jewish sources, this time of month of Elul, the 30 days of month of Elul, uh, before Rosh Hashanah is referred to as the time when the king is in the field. They say, king is in the field. King is, everybody repeats, king is in the field. King is in the field. No, no, I'm not saying everybody repeat after me. I'm saying everybody repeats. But okay. Okay. I'll give you that. I like that. Maybe you can repeat other things too. Let's see what else you can repeat. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, you, you hear people repeating that. Uh, where does this come from, though? You know, it comes from, as far, far as I can tell, it comes from Schneer Zalman of Liadi. It's the uh, Alter Rebbe, the, um, the founder of the Chabad uh, dynasty. Uh, Chabad Hasidim, he is the one who uh, introduced the subject that this time of the year is when the king is in the field. And it seems like he, which, we, and by saying that, what he means to say is that it's like the king comes out to the field and he, is access, he exits his palace. He comes out from the palace and he is in the field with, uh, with common people, making himself accessible to the common people so people can, he mingles with them and all that. And people can bring their petitions to him. You know, they don't have to jump through the hoops of palace bureaucracy. They can just have straight access and, and, and yeah. So it's, it's, it's the opportune time in this respect. And, and supposedly this is based on the verse from Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8, which says, uh, wait, and say it in Hebrew because it's kind of important, but I'll translate it also. It says, Veitron Eretz Bekol Hu, Melech Nevad, which means literally, or <laughs> There are various translations because it's a hard, it's a difficult verse. But you would translate it, you know, the um, uh, TLV would translate it: "Though the profit of the land is taken by all, or everybody benefits from the land, a king is served by the fields." Another translation would say: "A king is a servant of the field, or the king is subservient to the field." But the gist of the verse, and also in the context is that the field is such a fundamental um, thing <laughs> that everybody kind of depends on it. And the king also depends on the field. He benefits from everybody benefits from it. King benefits from it because later on, the verses that follow in Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, 10, says the one who, who has a lot of silver will not be satisfied and satiated with silver. Basically, you can't eat silver. <laughs> you know, no matter how much silver you have, you can't eat it. You need to have bread. Bread comes from the field. Field is more fundamental and important. You know, perhaps in the end times, you know, those who have land would <laughs> be would be the most well off un un until government comes and confiscates it. Because <laughs> the disadvantage of the silver you can put in your pocket run away. The disadvantage of the field, you cannot do that with a field. You kind of tie it to a place. But okay, I digress. It's not my topic. But this verse, this verse from Ecclesiastes, uh, that the king is subservient to the field, he depends on the field to feed his army and all that. And the I don't know how you, how you would derive the fact that the king is in the field uh, means uh, the analogy that the king is accessible to the people and all that. This kind of states kind of nothing like that. It means the approach to the field of the, by the king is purely utilitarian. 
He doesn't really care about the people. He cares about feeding his army. He depends on the field. Okay, fine. So nothing there, nothing in that verse would, would suggest a connection to this concept of king in the field and accessible. So not sure how Shner Zaman got that from it, but somehow he did. I don't know how. But I have, I, I have my own theory, probably not what he would say. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it, seems, it may work, may not. We'll see. I don't know. You'll, 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 you'll decide. Um, so, um, and it's interesting because it says, it says Veitron Eretz Bekolhu. The, the prophet of the land is for everyone. This word, Yitron, prophet. Uh, very interesting word, Yitron. Uh, only appears in the book of Kohelet, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Only appears there ten times. In the, no other book of the Bible that word appears, Yitron. Um, a derivative from the word yeter, yeter means leftover, like profit is something that you left with. Like you paid all the expenses, what you left with is profit. Uh, so, and it appears ten, ten times in the Kohelet, and I'm not, I'm not a big fan of gematria, but, some, but I use it sometimes, you know, sparingly, but I do. Gematria means, uh, actually, word, modern word geometry comes from the word gematria. Uh, gematria means uh, that uh, the words, you use numerical value of the letters to add them up and see what the words, word add, uh, adds up to. So this word yitron adds up to 666. <gasps> <Scary. laughs> uh, okay, I mean, prophet 666, okay, sounds like, yeah, prophet is evil. Like, you know, prophet's kind of evil. So 666 is kind of evil. But, you know, may not be so evil, depends what you do with it, right? Kind of, you know, neutral, like with the field. Same with the field. You can feed your army or you can feed your people. It depends who you feed with the field. Right? So it's kind of a neutral type of like nuclear energy. You can have a nuclear bomb and you can have a, or you can have a fusion and a clean energy. You know, it's like, it depends where you turn it. You know, it depends the intention, where you're going to turn It's a neutral thing, in a way. You know? And... Just like the person where it says, you know, the six is a, is a human number, the sixth day the, the person was created, and the person can be either beastly because we were created the same, same day with the animals, or it can be godly. It depends which way he's going to turn. The person is going to turn this way or that way. He has the free to, freedom of choice to turn this way or that way. You know, so it's a neutral, it's a neutral thing. Uh, but the first time, I know you probably heard it before I said it before, but the first time this number 666, the only time actually this number 666 appears in the, time, in the Hebrew Bible, it does appear in the Hebrew Bible. A lot of translations obscure it uh, because that's the weight of the gold that King Solomon brings in the first year of his reign. Or, you know, not the first year, sorry, in the first time when he sent the ships to Tarshish. It's in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. You can, you can enter, uh, you can open, I don't know which translation you have. Some translation, it says 666 talents of gold. And some translation, they would translate it into pounds or something. And if you do that, then that number goes away. It just becomes a pound number, some kind of measure of weight or, or I don't know for what. But, uh, but Hebrew is, is kikarim, it's the talents. 666 talents of gold. And um, also... In that, same, in that same chapter of the kings, it seems like the height of King Solomon, who is Kohelet, by the way, who is the author of Ecclesiastes, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the height of his reign. This is immediately after he's visited by the queen of the south. She comes, the queen of Sheba comes, he gives 120 talents of gold, many gifts. She comes and she's amazed at his wisdom and he is at the height of his of his triumph at that time. It's all downhill from there, by the way. But this is where he reaches the pinnacle. And then what it says in that same chapter is that he multiplies horses. He sends people to Egypt to get a horse. He multiplies wives. And he multiplies gold. Like he breaks the three commandments for the king, by the way, which appear in this Torah portion that we read today, the Shoftim, Torah portion Shoftim has these commandments for the king. King has three, three limits that king has not to exceed. Horses, gold, and wives. She cannot have a lot. It doesn't say how much. They don't give him a limit, there's this many, but don't multiply, just you know, be reasonable. Just don't have thousand wives, you know. You know. 20 is okay. 
also means 20 mother-in-laws. I don't know if that's a good or bad. Um, so, I am funny, right? I'm hilarious. My children. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the toughest crowd over there, to the right. Um, but the, all three of these, Solomon broke. And, and interesting, because the word for horse, sus in Hebrew, samech vav samech. Uh, the gematria of it is 130, but, that doesn't, but that's not interesting. But the word, the letters themselves taking by themselves, the gematria of the, of the letter samech, and Vav and the Samech, it's 60, 6, and 60. That's the gematria of the word horse. Uh, so it's kind of there somewhere, like, eh, it's lurking. Lurking behind the surface, it's that. That concept. Because, he mu because it, it, you know, that's what, that's what there is in the world. Because what's the horses? Horses is military might. Horses is the army. Horse and chariot. It's a tank. It's no wonder that the modern Israel tank is called Merkava, which means chariot. That's what they call the tank. Uh, so horses are military power. Gold is gold. It's money. And uh, wives are, you know, that's, that's the desire of the flesh. So you have three things. You have <laughs> lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of heart. It's just three things. That's all there is in the world. There's nothing else. This is all the things that the world has to offer, and there's nothing else in the world. Those things, taken to the extreme, they cause destruction. Taking in moderation, I mean, mo used moderately for good purpose, they're fine. They're neutral again, but taken to extreme, they, you know, when when that that like <laughs> becomes all there is, then 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 the purpose of the human being is erased and the human being becomes like an animal, reverts to that animal state and, and perishes. Just like it says that people who don't know, who don't understand, they're like animals who perish, as it says in the Psalm. So um, work, therefore, because you know it says six days you should work. Work is fine. Six days of work is fine. Six, six, six days of work is not fine. It's too much work. It's a work too hard. It's not going to do anything. There is, though, original work that we have, and which is, um, which is reflected in, it's in, it starts from the very, in the very beginning in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, it says, it says I'm going to again say it in Hebrew and translate it because it's important to, to, to understand. So, we call Siach Hasadeh Terem Yehebaaretz. We call Asaph Basadeh Terem Yetzmach Kilo Himtir Adonai Elohechem El Al Haaretz Vadam Lo Lavod Et Hadama. Which says, which means, we call Siach Hasadeh, like there is no bushes in the field. Siach is a bush or shrubs. There's no shrubs in the field yet, uh, and, the, and there was no grass in the field yet because God had not sent the rain on the land, and there was no man, Adam, to work the, 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 the land, the Adama. So there was both, there was both there's, there's no brush in the field because there's no man to work the field and God did not send the rain. I mean, what is this? What, what, what kind of, I mean, what the Adam did not plow the field and therefore grass didn't grow. That doesn't make sense. You know, we don't have to plow the field for the grass to grow. We plow the field to saw, saw the, 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 the bread and the, that harvest crops. That's what we work the, the fields for. We don't work the fields to grow jungles. They kind of grow themselves. <laughs> We, we don't do that. But what is this work that, that is referred to here? And, and we can have a clue later on in Genesis also in, in chapter 24, verse 63. It, sa it says about Isaac who went out, uh, from, went out into the field in the evening and he saw the camels coming. Rebecca is coming with the camels. It says in Hebrew, He's, he, he came out. It says lasuach basade to and the translation translators say it's to pray or to meditate in the field. But this word suach lasuach it's the same word as siach in Genesis two for shrubs. 
So, so, so Isaac did not go out to, to shrubbing in the field. He went out to, I guess, in, in the translation, he went out to meditate to pray. Because sicha, the word sicha means prayer. It's like, hear the Lord my prayer. It's like, hakshev uh, Hashem uh, et sichi. Give ear, Lord, to my prayer, to my supplication. It's some, it's some kind of a word, word for prayer. Therefore, we can, and the sages derive from it, that the original work of Adam, of a man, was to pray for the rain. Because when God will send the rain, then all the jungle will grow. He doesn't have to go plow the field for the jungle to grow. He just needs to pray for the rain. So the rain will come because God already put the seeds in the, line, in the, in the ground. And all it's needed is the rain for the seeds. To, so the original work, original work of a person, of a field, was not to plow it. It's to pray for God to send the rain. That's the original work, the pure type of work that we were assigned to, that, okay, that devolved into a curse, where it says, you will work the earth by the sweat of your brow, sweat of your nose, whatever. Basically, you're going to have itzavon. You're going to have suffering in that, in that work. The work would cause suffering. And it can be even perverted into the Arbacht macht frei paradigms. Arbeit macht frei is, is, of course, is the slogan over Auschwitz gates. The work sets you free, which it doesn't. Not that type. So, <laughs> Cain was the worker of the field. The first worker of the cursed field was Cain. Cain, sorry. But he was the usurper. He was this false king who wanted to profit through war. Because he killed his brother. He is the one who started the World War I. He, he killed his brother to what? To usurp the power, to get more for himself. Apparently, that's why. He won his brother there, so it was Cain who started this war. And, and, so, and so are all those who follow his path of Cain, the cursed path of Cain. That's what it is. It's the pursuit, uh, it's the usurpation of, the, of, of this original type of work for gain and for benefit, and not having in mind the original pure purpose. Field is external. You know, Esav, he is called man of the field. Ish hasadeh, he is called man of the field. Yaakov is called man, ish tam och, uh, yeshev ochel. He's called the, 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 the tam, the, um, like, um, a uh, perfect man or shy man or some kind of like introverted man who lives in, in, in the tents. Asaph is referred to as this man of the field, right? And this doesn't make him bad for that. It's not necessarily bad. And again, it's neutral. It's what you do with it. And, and when, when and Isaac, you know, he loves Asaph. He loved Asaph. He wanted him to succeed, obviously. And when Yaakov comes disguised as his brother Asaph to, to, to receive the blessing, to steal the blessing, what Isaac says when he smells him, says, behold, the smell of my son is like a smell of the field that the God has blessed. What is the field that God has blessed? That's the field you don't have to work that much. That's the field where you have to pray and it will grow. That is kind of field. Ideal Asav is the one who provides for his brother Yaakov in the fields, who put his brother, a king, over him. And so that the king of the spirit profits from the field work of a, of a man who is external, which is fine. This is how it's supposed to work. Isaac, who meets Rebecca in the field by going to pray, <laughs> they are the couple that... that perpetuate that are in the line of producing the Jewish people to produce the children. And that is, hey, children are equivalent of disciples. We know that the children are equivalent of disciples, just as it says in Isaiah 53 about Mashiach, he will see many children. As we know, Yeshua did not have any physical children, but all his disciples are his children. So therefore, children are disciples. And it says in Psalm 127, Behold, children are the reward of the womb. So the disciples, this is, this is the field work that matters. This is the field work is the producing of disciples that really matters. And any type of material support that that requires is just auxiliary. It's there. It's needed. You've got to eat something. Otherwise, you die. But it's auxiliary. It's not the primary purpose. And therefore, in order to make a disciple, in order to sow good seed in the field, the one who sows, the sower, the one who's, 
who gives the message has to have has to be ready has to be a pure soul has to not have in them a, a, a seed of bitterness therefore we have to, we yeah we have to be prepared when we make disciples we need to make sure that we are in a state of readiness that we are in a state of purity, that we know the priorities, that we know what's primary, what's secondary, that the spiritual is ahead and the physical is just, is just an auxiliary function. We have, and that, that is called, that, that we need to return to our original purpose. 40 days before Yom Kippur, which is the first of Elul, according to the biblical chronology, very likely also, this is where Moses ascended onto Mount Sinai for the second time to receive the second tablets. Because he, he came down on Shavuot. Uh, 40 days uh, later, he br brought back the first tablets. Then he broke it because of the golden calf. Then he went outside the camp for 40 days to, to ask for forgiveness. And then he ascended for 40, for 40 more days, 120 days between Shavuot and Yom Kippur. So Moses ascends the mountain on the first of Elul, 40 days before Yom Kippur. That's the time when we're talking about. This is now. And it is viewed in the Jewish tradition as a time of preparation for Yom Kippur or Shoshana, that we have to repent of our sins. I mean... It doesn't mean that we have to wait until now to repent. We always have to. It's not like, you know, we, we sin and stuff, and then we have to, like, wait until now to repent. No, you repent right away. So what's different? You know, how is this time different from any other time? You know, <laughs> how, is this, how is this month different from any other months? It's just that we examine it more closely. You know, maybe there are some things that we overlook. Because the closer one comes to God the more imperfection they seem. There is a concept that the bigger is the person, the bigger is their yetzer chara, which, is, which means the, the, the more righteous is the person, the more sinful that person becomes in their own eyes. It's just because it's, it's natural. You come to light and you see all imperfections. I mean, you talk to people in the street and they say, I'm a good person. You know, I don't need God. That's what happens. You, you, you talk, he's not, the person is not a murderer, not a rapist, not a drug user. Not a, just some guy who works, or a lady that works in, you know, in the local, I don't know, whatever. You know, and lives a life, has, you know, family. Everything's good. There's no, there is no, like, egregious things in their lives. And you tell them, you need, you need to repent. And from what? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm okay. I need to repent. And they're right. Because why? Because they don't see that. They don't, examine this. They, don't, they don't examine themselves in the light of, of God's word. From, from perspective of God, are righteous like filthy rags. And that's what, what is revealed to us the more we come to the light. It's like camera zooms to someone. In the, you, know, you see somebody and, and they're, and they're like good looking on TV. Camera zooms. It's like, oh my gosh, go away. It's like, <laughs> move back. <laughs> you know? Um, and that's what happens. It says, Psalm 30, 139, 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts. Actually, the word in Hebrew is, is sarfai. Actually, saraf is to burn. Like, everything that, like, bothers me to a point of burning. Examine me. And see if there's any offensive way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the one who, who wants to be cleansed asks God to search him or herself. How to search? How, search how? It also says in Proverbs 20, verse, forgot, didn't write, but chapter 20, trust me there. says, the soul of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his inmost being. Ner Hashem nishmat adam. The lamp of the Lord is the soul, nishmat adam, nishama. The word for the soul that's used is nishama. We know there's, there's actually five different words for the soul, the, the, the three lower to upper, but the, the, the three lower ones is nefesh, ruach, and nishama. Nefesh is something that we share with animals. Animals also has that, have that soul. Uh, ruach is the spirit, is what distinguishes a person from an animal. It's the intentions of the heart and where a person turns to his animal part or his godly part. And nishama is the godly soul, the one that's most closely connected to God, just like the ceiling 
is the other floor's floor. Because <laughs> there the ceiling is the closest to the next floor above. So the neshama is the is the is the part of the soul that is godly that's most closely connected to God. It is likened to a a, a deep sea diver. I had this analogy before, but some benefit those who haven't heard. It's likened to a deep sea diver who is connected to a pump that's on the ship, and a deep sea diver at the bottom is his helmet. That's the that's the uh, nefesh soul part where the air comes to rest, as we say. On the day seven, he God Shavat he didn't rest. He he nafash. He doesn't say he was refreshed. He remained in a static place. So it's where it's static. It's like without any movement. That's where the air rests at the bottom. That's the, that's the animal type of soul. The mu- ruach, ruach is wind, also is, is spirit, but also is wind. It's the movement of air. It's that hose that connects the deep sea diver to the pump. This is where the air moves from the pump into the helmet. And the neshama, it's the pump itself that pumps the air into, into the hose, into the deep sea diver's helmet. And so what happens when you cut off from the godly soul? I mean, you die, but not right away. <laughs> There's still some air in the hose, but you die. <laughs> the diver dies. When a person wants to live, and the life means connecting to the source of life who is God, the pump has to be on. And that's the nishama. So that, that nishama, that is the godly part. That's what it means to be born again. That the intention of the heart of a person is towards God. And not towards the animal part. It's towards godly function. And not towards the animalistic function. So therefore the nishmat, the, the, that the soul of man is the light of God. Nishmat adam ner Hashem. That that's why that soul s- serves as a light that God provides to find our imperfection. It's our conscience that condemns us if something's wrong. When someone comes close to God, then it is possible to see the imperfection and to see everything that we need to be repented of. So sins become more apparent the closer persons to God, just as the light reveals. You know, it is likened to, there's, this, there's a custom of bedikat chametz on Pesach. And the night before Pesach, we do bedikat chametz with a candle. We search for chametz for the children. We hide it in different places with foil. And when they find it all, we give them money. And our kids were, you know, that was the most exciting part for them to find that hamets where it was in the corners of our condo. I remember they were running around with that candle. Those were the cutest thing ever. Um, this, <laughs> I think somebody who didn't find it didn't get the money that caused trauma also, that, they still, that they're still experiencing to this day. But this is what you do. You search for Hametz with a candle. And Hametz in Pesach, in Passover, symbolizes sin. You know, the Hametz, just as it says in Corinthians, let us celebrate not with the, with the leaven of unrighteousness, but the, with, the, with the matzah of righteousness. That, with, not with leaven of sin, but matzah of righteousness, as Paul writes Paul to the Corinthians. So leaven represents sin. And searching for, le- for leaven, it represents the search of sin before Passover. Uh, but it's before Passover now we're not in Passover season. We're in the fall holiday season. Why is that? You know, what, then how is, it, how is it, you know, related? Well, because the fall holidays are actually a mirror of the uh, spring holidays. Like Sukkot is a mirror of Pesach, of Passover. How so? Where Pesach celebrates the exodus from Egypt. And Sukkot, the reason for Sukkot, you read it. You live in the booth. You will remember that you dwelled in the desert when you went out of Egypt. So just like Passover is a celebration of the Exodus, also Sukkot is a celebration of the Exodus. So they are mirror images of each other. They're both seven days plus one, eight days, <coughs> so on and so forth. And, so, and also, in between Passover and Shavuot, there is a period of 50 days that we count Surat HaOmer. And so there is a period between Passover and Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, or even period between, between Sukkot and now, it's like, well, 47 days, 40 days. So it's, it's very much similar. There is a period in between the, 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 Shavuot, the Shavuot and Passover and, Yom Kippur, and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as well. There are a period of, um, of 50 days there, 10 days here. But 
if on Shavuot we have received the first tablets, on Yom Kippur we have received the second tablet. So, so, so Yom Kippur is the second Shavuot in that respect. So again, there's a mirror image going on there. It's not one for one in terms of days of interval, but the concept is the same. They're, they're mirror images of each other. They're, they're, they're related to one another, these holidays. And so just like the counting of the Omer are the days of preparation, so is these days of between first of Elul until Rosh Hashanah, 30 days, and until Yom Kippur, 40 days. These are also days of preparation. What is this 40 days? Well, we know that in the, from Passover, count 40 days, these were the 40 days when Yeshua was, was with his disciples after resurrection, before he ascended, like Moses ascended for 40 days to the mountain. So as Yeshua ascended, but before, before Yeshua ascended, for 40 days he was with his disciples, according to the book of John, teaching them about the kingdom of heaven. He was there with them for 40 days. Some were mingled with them somewhere in the fields of the Galilee before he ascended. And then 10 days later, just like Moses brought the Torah on Shavuot, and then the second tablet, Yom Kippur, 10 days later, he sends his Ruach HaKodesh, not leaving us orphans, them and us, to what? To testify in our spirits that we are the children of God. God sends his Ruach so that we testify in our Ruach. Remember Ruach, it's where your intention lies. That we are the children of God to point to our godly function and not to our animalistic function. And like Moses, Moses came back with the second tablets. Yeshua also is going to come back. When, when, when the, 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 the disciples saw the vision of angels, the angels said, Men of Galilee, why are you staring at the sky? This Yeshua who went up, he will come down in the same way. And you go and do what he says, make disciples, right? Go make disciples. All authority in heaven and earth is given me, therefore make disciples. Have children that way. So Yeshua will come back. When will he come back? Well, we know. He'll come back at the blowing of the trumpet. Can be either Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, by the way, because trumpet is blown both in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. There is, Rosh Hashanah is blown 100 times. Yom Kippur is only blown once. But uh, it's blown both times. So we don't really know necessarily. I'm not here to say this is when, this is that, this is because. I, I don't know. But it's, it seems like. Uh, how do we know that? There's a passage in the First Corinthians chapter 15 about the Shafar Gadol, the great Shafar. But also there's a passage in First Thessalonians 4, 13. This is what it says. Now, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve like the rest of who have no hope. For we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, so with him God will also bring those who are fallen asleep in Yeshua. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way precede those who are asleep. <clears throat> For the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and the blast of the gods show far. And the dead of the Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive and are left behind will be, uh, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So that he shall all, so we shall always be with the Lord. Encourage one another with these words. You know, rapture passage. Right? Rampasso is the rapture. But that's not the word I want to focus on. There is this word that says we are left behind. Very, very famous word for left behind. In Greek, it's peri, perileipomenoi, in this case. Perileipomenoi, left behind. Perileipo, leipo, peri, it's uh, um, um, over. Leipo, behind, or left, like over left. Something left over, right? We heard left over. And it's interesting, when, when Yaakov was wrestling with the angel uh, in the Septuagint, thank you for <laughs> the concordance, I just got to give it, it's amazing. In the, in, in the Septuagint, this word, it says, <laughs> ufelefen, 
says, Yaakov have left alone, with a leif, and says, Septuagint, translating the Hebrew word, Vayivater, says, Vayivater Yaakov levado, Yaakov has been left alone. This word, Vayivater, is translated with a leif, and leif left behind. Yaakov was left behind, right? Vayivater, from the word yeter, yeter means left, yetron means prophet, left over. That is the prophet, is what's left over. When Yeshua comes back, he comes to collect his prophet. We are his prophet. We are his Yitron that he comes to collect when he returns. We are who are left behind. Those who are left over are his prophet. Come from those who come after great tribulation and a great sorrow. We are the prophets that the king comes to collect. Kohelet, the one who collects. Ecclesiastes, the collector. The one who comes to collect. And gather all of God's children. And we are the people, in the end, who come out of the city into the field to greet the returning king. Because why the field is surround the city? When the king comes back, those inhabitants of the city come into the field to greet the king in the fields. The king is in the field. One who's coming back. I'm sh- I don't think Alter Rebbe wrote, read Thessalonians. <laughs> he read something else. Apparently he came up with that concept somewhere. I don't know how. He's genius. I don't know how he came up with that. But I cheated. <laughs> and I kind of short-circuited it. And <laughs> went to the Thessalonians. And that's what, that's, what, that's what I found that way. But God gave us his Holy Spirit to testify of this fact that he is coming back in this manner. And so that through that, we can comfort each other with these words and also to make disciples in the world that will be very pretty short on comfort. The world is going to be very short on comfort. It is already. Imagine after certain things. He gave us his Holy Spirit to testify this. And to move us to this perpetual purifications that this time of the year reminds us of. Therefore, we are to, to purify ourselves and to prepare for the coming of the king. Whether he's coming this year or not, probably not. But so, so many things need to happen. But he's close. He's coming close. His coming is closer. Come quickly, Lord Yeshua, Maranatha. And may we be ready when he comes and not be ashamed. May we be purified enough so that we are not ashamed to go out into the field and to greet our king when he returns. Father in heaven, we pray that you will impart upon us a greater measure of your Holy Spirit. We pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit before the coming of the day of the Lord, great and terrible. So you'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers. You'll circumcise our hearts and the hearts of our children. You will circumcise the hearts of all to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit and to be your witnesses throughout the ends of the earth, even in this time. As the time is short and you're coming quickly, we pray that we will be like the wise maidens that have oil purchased and ready to light the lamps and to enter into the comfort of our Lord and not like the foolish one who ran around the last second. Pray, Father, that we will be watchful and prepared for a master to return. We will seek all opportunity to redeem the time and to make disciples out of every tribe, tongue, and nation, but more importantly, or uh, primarily to the Jew first. Because that was the way of the disciples, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Lord, all the Greeks already heard. It's the turn for you to turn to your people Israel. We pray, Father, for comfort. Comfort people of Israel with the good news of salvation and consolation, saying to Zion, Your God reigns. We thank you, Father, and bless you in Yeshua's name.